Folks, welcome back to Todd Bosley's world famous YouTube channel. Today we are with Tony DeNegris and this is the man. This is the guy who found the Muhammad Ali 1965 Phantom Punch tickets. We're gonna show you this right here. Tony, I'm gonna hand that to you. Sure thing. So that's a $100 floor ticket. Tell me a little bit about that. Tell me how you got involved with it. Give us your story. All right, this uh, ticket is the rarest and hardest to find of whatever tickets might be out there still, if there are any. It is the main floor ticket. Now it comes out of a little hockey arena in Lewiston, Maine, which is where the fight took place. Now that is So the... let me stop you for just one minute. Sure. So there's another ticket that exists and that's this ticket. And this ticket is the real Phantom ticket because this ticket was slated for Boston, Massachusetts in Boston Garden. But they said, no, 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 Sonny Liston might be a gangster, right? That's correct. All right. And then what's funny about Sonny Liston is he actually ends up working in Las Vegas as a door greeter, which is maybe there's some truth to it. Well, there's still a dispute going on after all these years. But no at, the one end, knows the answer. at the end, they would not let him box in Boston. That's correct. So take us from there. All right. Well, I want to let the folks know that the published story that is co conveniently told about the match not being held in Boston was because the uh, claim of Ali couldn't get a license for the uh, for the fight having on that venue in time for the for the event to take place. And I don't believe it. There's a whole bunch of people that don't believe it. What we got basically from the horse's mouth, and I'll tell you who that would be in a moment as we get to it, <clears throat> was that the district attorney, and this is a political thing for all you politicians out there, mm. did not like Sonny Liston. In Boston. In, in Boston. Well, I don't think he liked him at all because he had what they claimed were known ties to the mob. In Boston, though. But then a mayor reached out, right? Right. Uh, it, was actually, uh, it was actually published in the, in the Boston Globe that uh, the district attorney said, we don't, like, we don't want the likes of Sonny Liston in our town. Mm -hmm. And for that very reason, the uh, planned and scheduled event for the rematch was canceled. And they had sold so many tickets. Who knows how many uh, got returned, how many were just thrown away or lost or whatever, but them uh, uh, tickets that do remain also are very rare. So when the article was published in, in the Boston Globe, the mayor of a little town in Maine, Lewiston, Maine, seized upon the moment and saw an opportunity. He got in touch with the promoters and said, hey, listen, guys, we got a nice little convenient hockey arena up in our town, and we have seating for 2,500, and I believe 64 people. Uh, but that was before uh, they added the tickets that were uh, the, the seating on the floor, and of course they had standing room only, so there, there was certainly more, more uh, in attendance than the original uh, a 2,500 and some odd uh, number of seats that were available in the arena uh, as if it were a hockey game going on. But we guess it to be somewhere around 3,000 or less seats. I would say so, sure. People there. Yeah, because you can't get that many tickets on the floor. They had the platform in the middle, and the hockey arenas are not traditionally that big. So let's start with your story because I think it's very interesting. You worked for a company that traveled around the United States and bought memorabilia. Correct. Okay, tell us the story about how you found the Ali tickets. All right, my company, and uh, I'm not gonna mention any names, uh, it's, it wouldn't be fair to do so, but I worked for that company based out of North Carolina. Uh, we travel everywhere, or all across the country. Um, and I was in Augusta, Maine. And I can't tell you how close Augusta is to Lewiston, but evidently it's, all, it's not all that far. And we were doing a show at a hotel where at that point in time we would we would invite people to come in and bring their collectibles of all kinds and we would estimate their value for them and we would also make offers to buy so certainly they had no there was no no, no uh, holds on anything it, they 
could buy, they could uh, they could sell to us if they want, or you can just get a free estimate, no problem. So what happens on the day when these tickets showed up? So here I am sitting behind my table. There was only three of us on our team. Three tables set up in a meeting room in a hotel. And uh, we would take turns. Whoever came in, first come, first serve. If you're busy, the next guy gets you. And we had always a crowd of people. So uh, a little older fellow came in, and I truly would say he must have been around 90 years old. He comes in with a little, a little, not quite a shoebox, a little half a shoebox size container. Very small, flat, not too high. And inside the box, as he sits down in front of me, he opens up the lid and showed me there's these tickets in there. And in those original uh, groupings of tickets, there was the pink $50 arena uh, ticket, which I call hot pink, and it truly is a beautiful hot pink color. And then you have the yellow or the gold color $100 arena ticket. Now, this one that we originally showed you is the main floor $100 ticket. Those were for the, those were for the, the immediate seating, probably for VIPs, around the platform. Right after that, they went up into the arena where the, where the bleachers were or however they had the seating set up. So those were also $100 tickets the ones that were uh, closer. And then as they got a little higher, you got up into the $50 uh, seating tickets. So he originally bought in <clears throat> a box with uh, two groups of tickets. They were bundled in uh, tight elastic bands, which is totally a mistake. So what's he say when he shows up? I got something for you to see. He actually, he didn't even know totally what he had because he, the first words out of his mouth, I'm going to show you something. I remember exactly what he said. I'm going to show you something here that I've had on my shelf in my closet in my hallway for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And he opens up the lid, and I see all these tickets in there, and I look right away, and I can recognize Muhammad Ali. Ironically, this gentleman did not know or remember who Ali was. He pointed okay. to Sonny Liston. And he says, I know who this this guy is, but I don't know who this guy is. There was a point where Sonny Liston was very popular. Oh, yeah. Compared I, to sure. Ali. I mean, Ali's very, been very popular, but I remember a certain time in my life when Liston... Oh, he was the champ. Yeah. When you're the champ, hey, you're the man. Right. So uh, I said to him, this is Muhammad Ali. Now, he only had two sets of tickets in that box, the $100 ticket and the $50 ticket. And I did not know that there existed any others. We made a deal. I bought them. It was a limited quantity. But uh, later on, I acquired the remaining tickets. And we'll get to that in a moment. But I want to tell you the story. Because naturally, I was amazed that here are all these uh, tickets in a box that were supposedly out of a, out of a fight that was sold out. So my, one of my early questions to this gentleman, how did you get uh, this, this grouping of tickets when there were no, no seats that were vacant? The whole thing was sold out. People were clamoring on the outside to get in. They couldn't even fill the place. I so mean, you're talking it. about this ticket, and I just want to be clear with everybody. This is the stub and the full ticket together. So I'm showing that. You have the stub and the ticket. Explain how that happened. Sure. There's a tear off. There's a, a little dotted, uh, you can hardly see it. It's a dotted... Right cut there. through press right line going through there they're supposed to tear the stub out the short part and throw it in their little container and then to give the bigger part to the person to go to their seat so this guy had a thought at the time he knew the fight was was uh very well promoted and he knew it was a big time fight so he decided on his own that he was going to try to retain as many tickets as possible for his own self, keep them from giving, returning to the pur purchaser who was then uh, guided to a seat or a group of seats if there was numerous people, and uh, he would bring them to their seat, and if they didn't ask for their ticket, he would just slip it in his vest pocket. That's how he acquired what we now call full mint tickets. And traditionally, when you have a ticket of this uh, caliber where it doesn't look like it's ever been presented for admittance, um, it is generally thought that that's a ticket that is uh, 
uh, somebody kept, bought and kept, uh, possibly in a drawer or maybe on their refrigerator with a magnet or something, and then never went to the fight. So therefore, you have a ticket that, in that case, would really wouldn't have much history other than it was a ticket for the fight that never got used. Well, these tickets are quite different, and I think that's a unique aspect of what we got here when we discovered these tickets, because they were actually at the fight, and they are actually used tickets, but never torn apart. Therefore, they, they render the classification of full mint. So let's start with this ticket. So this ticket, as you can see, is November 16th of 1964. This is the Boston ticket. This is the fight that did not happen. They printed the tickets. This was for an employee, but that that fight never happened because of the district attorney's office. Right. That was, and they call that a phantom event. A phantom. It's a phantom so, ticket because it's a ticket for a fight that never took place. It's the phantom ticket for the phantom punch fight that well, came later. Well, the phantom later. punch. And this is the phantom punch fight, which then occurred. May 25th of 1965, as you can see. So we went from November 16th all the way until May until they found found the place for this fight. From, from uh, mid-fall to, uh, to uh, late spring. And then, of course, this fight is the fight in the first round. Ali hits him. Right. And depending on the angle that you look at it and see... Did he hit him or didn't he hit him? And that's where all the controversy came in. I can't make in. my mind up, Todd. And listen, fat, listen, Phil, and Ali's visibly upset, screaming, get up, get up. And that created the great photo that we know from the family right. fight. Yes, that photographer, that photo went around the world. He, that photograph made, I think he won a Pulitzer Prize with it. I, I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Sonny Listener was... I don't want to say that he was stunned physically. I think he was stunned mentally because as the story goes, um, when you watch the fight on the net, you can certainly look it up. It's out there. You can pop it up on Google and you can see it. And I'll leave it to you folks to decide what you think. Two schools of thought here. Well, one school of thought is that Liston... Took, took a fall, on not intentionally, but once he got down on the ground, he threw. He threw. He, he didn't want. They to think come he up took there. a fall for the mob. Yeah, Just basically so you know. that something like that. Yes. No, that's it's hard, exactly to, hard to kind of figure out how that was would have transpired. But one school of thought is that Ali actually hit him and tossed him for a loop, and he went down to the ground. But it's interesting to watch it because when. Liston finally got up as Jersey Joe Walcott was the referee, counting him down, you know, the number of counts till he was going to be called out. But Liston got up in time. He did not know that his, his corner man threw in the towel. And if you look at Liston, Liston's expression on his face, he was stunned by that. He just didn't realize it. It was over. And that's the controversy. Did he take the? Did he get hit by Ali and really fall down to the ground? And and then, the uh, his ring man thought that he was not getting up, so he threw the towel in just at the same time. I think there was only one count left, and 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 Liston gets up, and he's he didn't even know that he had lost the fight at that point in time. Mm -hmm. uh, if you watch the fight again, it's even hard to see if an actual punch made contact to his face. Hard to see. They still debate it all the time. Uh, but we'll go back to the tickets. So at this point in time, uh, I'm, I have now made a deal with this gentleman, and I have two groups of tickets. They are the uh, gold ticket and the pink ticket, $100 and the $50 for seating. He leaves. He goes home. And an hour and a half later, I thought I was all done with this guy. He comes walking back in with another box. <laughs> I'm like, back. what? Same. He opens up the box, similar quantity of tickets, not that many, to truthfully, and uh, but they were not the same tickets. They were the standing room only tickets, which are a uh, $50 creamy colored beige, kind of like a sam light salmon color. They call it orange, but it's really not an orange color. Uh, and then the blue. 
So we have now four varieties. Now, I did not acquire any of the main floor tickets that time. Uh, the ones that, that possibly came out over time, people had them here or there or whatever. And we think that perhaps another, another uh, agent at the fight or a usher, seating attendant, just exit out. Slide it over. Okay, you got it. Um, uh, maybe had done the same thing. So there's a few more tickets that uh, that probably came out of the spike that were also held by the seating attendants. And I think the main floor tickets were probably part of a, uh, uh, a grouping that another attendant who had the, the responsibility of taking care of people that were seated on, on the floor. These were mostly the VIPs. And uh, hence we had four varieties of tickets. There were none at the time known to exist. I sent the initial batch in, not the whole bunch, just half a dozen, to PSA. They struggled with what to do with these tickets for a long time before Explain I got them Explain that process. I think and that's an interesting process. they had to create the process. category. Before that, there was no category. For so you tickets. send the tickets in, and what happens? Well, uh, the first t group of tickets I sent in, uh, naturally, uh, I graded them with my own judgment, and I decided that I thought what was the best ticket to send in. I just sent a few tickets in and they all came back PSA nines at that point in time, after they made the decision and the categories were established. Um, and I got them back and I did nothing with them. Uh, a month or so went by and I said, you know, let me refine my qualifications of, of how I graded these tickets. And I picked a few more tickets that I wanted to send in. I thought they were really superior. I sent them in and I ended up with four tens and they are the only tens that were ever graded in ten. They're the only ones. So you found all four. All four. Yep. Came back as a ten, and nothing else ever came back. Now PSA doesn't have a half grade uh, point system in in tickets. So when you look at a nine, one nine versus another nine, or one eight versus another eight, it's very possible that one eight might be a little better than, one ticket one might, might be a little better than the other one, so that perhaps it would have been an eight and a half. So we could have possibly intermediate grades in between the numbers of eight, seven, eight, and nine, but they just don't do it, so that's what we have. We have tens, nines, eights, and then down. And the majority of what I sent in uh, were eights and nines, with the exception of the four tens that came back. Mm -hmm. And they are quite rare quite rare, if, if any even exist anymore out there. Well, as I began to complete my collection or acquire my collection, which I'm not sure it's complete yet, I was really surprised about how little numbers there are of these tickets in higher grades. That's right. The higher grades is where it drops drastically. The nine with the four tens, and those will be out of the way because we're probably never going to see any more. But even the nines, I don't. I can't recall the various uh, uh, totals of each category, but it's it's in the teens somewhere. Oh yeah, it's yeah, very that's low. it. Yeah. Uh, and that's what makes the thing valuable. Now, uh, Todd, would uh, do you want to mention the uh, the uh, the uh, April twenty fourth auction at yeah. Robert Edwards? Tell them about it, Robert Edwards. Uh, we don't auctions. have a pink ticket handy, no, but we do uh, the fifty dollar pink ticket, uh, the latest sale of a, of a graded fifty dollar pink ticket, and this is a seating ticket for the arena for that fight, uh, went on sale in Robert Edwards auction. You can look it up under REA auctions or Robert Edward auction. And uh, April 24th, it sold for $6,500. That was in a PSA 9 grade. Only, uh, only we can imagine what a 10 would have brought if we even had one. You then. never know. And I do not have any more of the tents. They were long gone. I just sold them along a bit back. So let's just say that. And whoever got them is very lucky because now they've got a real value on their hands. Mm -hmm. uh, so these things are getting hot. There's fewer available. And uh, we just think it's where to be. If you're, if you're an Ali fan and if you want to collect something and if you can try and get them, you got to go for it because they're just going up. Well, my thought process on boxing is that it's worldwide. Um, I've noticed when I bought things, one of, a set of these tickets I actually bought from Australia, which you may right. not think is yeah. boxing, but 
Oh, uh, collectors everywhere. Yeah, Ali is everybody. Who doesn't know Ali, right? As far as my football, baseball collections go, I'm not buying those from out of the country. Typically, mm -hmm. that's within the country. But boxing spans worldwide. Correct. Uh, again, they are the world boxing champion. And that's what I love about it, because if you're going to make an investment into any type of item, why not invest into something that the whole world is interested in? And this thing has a whole bunch of history around it. First of all, the story about how the tickets were actually saved. They were saved from this fight. That's what they really were. That's a unique story. That, that's historical in a sense of its own. Plus, the fight is one of the most famous, if not the most famous fight. And it, it goes by the Phantom Punch, the fight that was called the Phantom Punch, the Ali first round knockout. I don't know if it was what? 12 seconds. It wasn't into, very long. 12, 13 <laughs> seconds into the fight, yeah. he was down. So much controversy. I got to tell you guys, if I had paid to see the site, to, to sit there and see that fight, I would have been disappointed. For, yes. To pay $100 to sit in the, the fight that was, see a fight that was over in 10, 12 $100 seconds. $100 <laughs> in 1965. Imagine how much yeah, money that was. Yeah, back then. That, that was might have been money. the equivalent of a couple thousand exactly. dollars or more. But still, it made world history. Mm -hmm. And there we have it. What do you think? Well, Tony, I think it's really great that you took the time to share that story with us. Um, oh, I, I think just it's, love, I love, love Tony. I think it's very interesting, and I have to tell you, I'm actually going to want to do a video about Tony. I'm an avid collector. I know Tony is a massive collector. He has quite a collection. Uh, he's very knowledgeable, and uh, let's just tell people about our relationship, how I met you. It's hilarious. Todd and I have known each other, what now, I don't know, six, seven months, something Not like that. Not very long. That's all. And Todd found me uh, when he was pursuing uh, the Ali tickets. Uh, let me ask you, Todd, what made you get interested in, in trying to find one of these tickets when you first got your first one? What, what brought you to that point? Well, I've always been an Ali fan, and I've always been a Liston fan. I've been a boxing fan in general, just uh -huh. because my grandfather... As a younger man, he would watch boxing, and I never really understood it, but it was something that he and I bonded over, and I eventually began to, I don't even know if I still really like boxing. It's so brutal, well, but, it is. but I like the idea of a hero. I like the idea of Ali. I like the idea of Mike Tyson. Unfortunately, I didn't like the way Mike Tyson ended. That was disappointing. Yeah. But um, for whatever reason... I started researching these tickets, and I realized there just weren't a whole lot of them. I mean, there are all these boxing tickets in basically a five or higher in most of the tickets. There are not there are not many of those, and That's they sell true. for a lot of money. So I was really looking into an investment that made sense for me. What can I put some money into that's going to appreciate not only for my kids, but my grandkids and their kids? Well, that's what we do when we get to our age. Now, Todd's, Todd's a, a little younger than me. He's a whippersnapper uh, <laughs> compared to me. But, uh, I hope I look better than my age, and I'm not going to tell you how old I am. But Todd's a youngster. Let's put it that way. In any case, Todd found me, yeah. and then we went from there. Yeah. And then you went and found, uh, you, you got so he acquired some tickets from me, and then he acquired, uh, researched, and found other, other people where he, that were offering tickets, and he acquired them also and his collection at this point is pretty massive it is massive and i'm trying to create one of the greatest collections on earth to be honest with you um give me your opinion though i mean i look at all of these different items i see these new cards coming out from all these different card companies and they're making runs of specials 50 of these and 20 of these but there's 50,000 of each one it's it's really insane. I mean, the amount of product they're printing now uh, is is way overproduced. But tell me what you think, Tony. And this is just a guess. This is this is because you've been a collector, as I understand, most of your life. Mm -hmm. What happens? I'm just going to show this ticket right here. That's a floor ticket. That's a very hard ticket to find. That's the grade of eight, not the grade of nine. That's, we, that's we, probably the best ticket in your collection. It Don. may be. Absolutely. It may be, but it's still an eight, not a nine. And that may yes, be one of, of the highest highest ones. But what does this ticket do over the next 10 years, 20 years, and 50 years? What happens to a ticket like this? What's, well, what's the value? 
people that are into collecting certainly realize that things get hot, things get cold, all right? But in general, they always keep going up. You may have periods of flatness for maybe a year or so, but when you look at what you have here and the uh, popularity of the sport in general, as, as popularity rises for any activity in sporting, people want to collect and they get older, they start off as children. I mean, look what I remember. I was in the, I was brought up in the day when I could pick up Mickey Mantle cards. Did I? No. I had them, certainly. Tell them and what you did with your Mickey Mantle cards. Come on, that's Everybody a knows story. this story. I'm not the only one. What we did as kids, we put the, the cards on the, 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 the outside bar of our uh, bicycle uh, the rear tires, front tires, and it with a, with a clothespin. And we had the cars facing into the spokes, and when the car, when the wheels went around while we were riding, they would flap and make a, no, a fluttering noise. That's what we did with our cars. Little did we know what we were throwing away. But to make matters worse, I'm one of those unlucky souls that succumbed to my mom. Mm -hmm. uh, when I went into service, I had a considerable collection still, and they were all used, of course, but I had my box of baseball cards. I had a lot of good guys in there. Whitey Ford, Yogi Berra, uh, Sandy Koufax. They were all in there. Mickey Mantle was in there. When I came back from, from the service, this was in the Vietnam area, no cards, no cards on top of my wardrobe. What'd you do with the cards, Mom? You're a man now. You don't need that baby stuff. And they were gone. I never saw them again. And that just did not happen to me. That happened to a lot of people. But to be fair, you were a man because you were a United well, States Marine. Well, sure, and I thought nothing of it. And you went it. to Vietnam. And I thought nothing of it at that time. Yeah. And but I was disappointed in the cards because this was one of the things that I, you know, I had collected for myself. I share that with so many uh, uh, young fellows that came back from the service. It happened not just to me. It happened to a lot of people. Same thing with comic books. But in any case, these tickets represent a tie to our past and that is priceless and as you grow older you come to realize that your past is important and your past means something to you we all know what it feels like when we drive down the road or we go somewhere and we see something some unique little snippet of time posted on a hung on a wall somewhere uh you never know what it is and it just brings you right back to that time when you were a kid and you oh i remember that I mean, and that's the feeling you want to capture. Uh, as popularity increases with any sport, then the collectability is also going to increase. These things have nowhere to go but up. Only up. In over 10 years, who knows? We that's my question. Let's talk about 10 years. Considerable value. 6,500 is the last number nine that we've seen. What's it look like 10 years from now, in your opinion? 10 years from, well, if that nine that sold at Robert Edwards at $6,500, and that includes the buyer's premium, we have to be fair about that, that does, did include the buyer's premium, but if that was a $6,500 ticket just six months ago, what is that ticket going to be 10 years from now? Think about it. I can't put a number on it. We just don't know, but think about it. It's just a very interesting, and this is a, fa a famous fight one of the most famous if not the most famous so i just uh i fell in love with these tickets i've had them for a number of years and now todd has relieved me of uh, <laughs> my entire stock uh and remember something about these tickets i want you to know that on the surface if you look at a mint ticket that's not torn and stub removed you would think automatically that again i said this earlier but i want to elaborate on it you would think that, oh, it's just another ticket that was left in somebody's uh, uh, drawer that they forgot, that they never went to the, to the fight. But this, this ticket, rep these tickets represent uh, a unique situation because I don't believe this has probably ever been done before. This attendant was, uh, okay, let's admit he was a little sneaky and he kind of did something on, under the cover by keeping the tickets. But if he didn't do that, we wouldn't have these tickets now. They have history with them all i can tell you they do and you know i want to say like i look at investments i look where can i put my money that makes the most sense where's it going to grow you ask how i got into these tickets 
I started looking to buy like very popular sports people. I wanted to buy their rookie cards and I wanted to buy them in PSA 10. I didn't want eight, nine or any of that. I went and I looked for um, Tiger Woods. He, yeah. One of the greatest ever. He's had some trouble in his life, but oh, sure. as far as his professional life, a really great athlete. I mean, undeniable. Oh, no doubt about it. Undeniable. I look up his PSA 10 rookie card and it goes for about 350 bucks. This is in 2022. Right now, yeah. Yeah, and so I go, I'm like, wow, that's an incredible value, right? You couldn't beat that. Sure. I go to PSA verification because I want to see how many there are. There's 11,500 of them. Yeah, 10. 11,500 PSA 10s. Well, to me, that's not an investment. That's exactly when, right. I when I see you. a ticket like this, and there's there's less than 50 in an 8, oh, and wow. there's less than yeah. 10 in a 9... I'm all in. I mean, where can you get that? This that's is... what. That's that's the key. You can collect a lot of popular, uh, you know, heroes in sports. Uh, look at Ken Griffey, his rookie card. Oh boy, I got a Ken Griffey rookie card. Well, what happened when that card came out? Everybody was into collecting, so these kids didn't do what we did. They didn't use the card. They didn't flip them against the wall and play leaner, and they didn't put them <laughs> on their bicycle. They bought sleeves. They put. Ken Griffey rookie, boom, right into the sleeve, and now there's uh, I don't even know how many thousands of ten, of high grade, perfect mint cards. You Too won't many. find that with these tickets and other and other things that are out there. So that's why you buy the best of the best with the least amount of uh, population. That's your investment, and that's I think what Todd was uh, alluding to. And I I, I really uh, congratulate you for for having that that kind of thinking and applying it to acquiring these tickets. I think that um, I think there are some really great deals right now. If you use your head and you look at what people are collecting, I kind of try to equate it to your generation, which is different than my generation. Not by too far. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not too far, but it's a little bit. We're, we're about 20 years in difference. Right. And then my right-hand man that runs my business, he's about 20 years different. Well, a little, more, a little more than 20 years different. So, for instance, your your group had a certain group of collection that it did. It mainly was baseball cards. Perfect, yeah. And then my generation, and it was more books. like Garbage Pail. And then my right-hand man's generation is more like Pokemon. There so, you go. I, you know, I understand your generation. I don't know if you understand my generation, but I don't understand his generation. <laughs> I don't even know what a Pokemon is. Well, and I can tell Pikachu? you about Pokemon. Well, oh, Pokemon. That's because you're the greatest Just go look ever. at the prices on somebody, and it's not with every card. Let's bear that in mind. But there are some very special cards that are way, way, way up there. It's just phenomenal. And I've asked you this question a lot, and this is, I think, the most important question that any collector could ever ask. Are people 30 or 40 years from now going to know who Mickey Mantle was? I think we agree the answer is yes. Absolutely. Do people 30 years from now know who Garbage Pail Kids are? I you can't. may not, but our generation will. Right. And 30 years from now, are they going to know who Pokemon is? And I think those are the terms that you have to think in. I'm 50, going to be 51 <laughs> this year. Okay. So you're, you're more in the baby boomer sector. Right. I am not. Yeah. So my generation for the next 15 or 20 years, maybe, are going to be looking to invest. For sure for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I look at it, I look at different items and I say, okay, should I buy this and is it going to be worth more money in a 10-year period? If it's not worth more money in 10 years or it may not be worth more money in 10 years, I don't want to mess with it. But if it's a sure bet, if it's something that is guaranteed, I will, I'll buy it. Want it. But I got to do my homework on it. That's and why that's I love you these Ali tickets. tickets. Is that correct? It is, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm a hundred percent positive on these tickets. And we've seen these tickets appreciate just in a few years. We've that's seen right. them go crazy. Well, you know, things in general, uh, there's always stagnation periods uh, when you talked about uh, every all kinds of investments. Things can sit flat for a whole long time and all of a sudden, wham, they just take off. Uh one thing that Todd and I have discussed is uh the was the average acquisition of wealth increasing year by year overall in this country as more money is available people are doing better the economy is doing better 
uh, people are earning more, they have more disposable income. They're getting older. As time goes by, what do they do with this extra income? It creates demand for collectibles. Mm -hmm. That's why, and I give you an example, I know it's probably on the high end extreme, but we'll use the reference of Mickey Mantle's 311 card, number 311. 1952 tops. Right, 1952 tops. I did some research on that. You could have bought, and I can't give you the exact numbers in my head right now, but I, I will average it out. If you bought a $300,000 card, uh, and let's say that was like a eight or a nine, six, seven years ago, you could have bought it for $30,000. Now it's $250,000, $300,000. Easy. Just use or more. that. Or more. Uh, uh, or yeah. more. And, you yeah. know, I'm just doing a rough up of it. You can do the research. Very simple. Easy to do. Search prices on PSA. Then search auction prices also on PSA and do the comparisons year by year. You can see it all. Do it by grade and you'll say, wow, I could have bought that car for uh, X amount of dollars and made 10 times my money now. What's going to happen in 10 years from now? I mean, are we going to be able to... I threw this at Todd a few times. Who, all right, you bought a card now for a uh, million dollars. Okay. And uh, who's going to pay 10 million 10 years from now? Well, we don't know what kind of money the average person is going to be earning. But there's going to be wealthy people, as there always has been. And we're making more and more millionaires every year in this country. What do they do with their money? They buy this stuff. There you go. It's great to have. I mean, especially if you know uh, many people's ambition is to own a nineteen two or a nineteen fifty two Mickey Mantle. I I have to say, I'm one of those. You're guys. still searching, yeah. right, Todd? <laughs> well, I am still searching, but you know, I you you were talking about that number seven or number eight, three eleven nineteen fifty two yeah. card. I mean, I've seen that card go well into the over half a million dollars. Oh, it yeah. may have even participated in the bidding on something like that. But I've just never been able to bring myself to that kind of money uh, to say, yeah, I think it's going to keep going up. You never want to be the highest bidder in the auction in all-time history. But sometimes you got to say, boy, there just aren't many of these. Well, just because, and this, this, is, this is true in the stock market, they say, when there is, there's people that invest in the stock market and they, and they, they look at, a stock that's inclining in value and they say oh i don't want to buy it because it's the it's it's already up at the top the problem is uh when a clock when, when a stock or any investment vehicle all right starts a run to the north <laughs> all right it's always going to be at the top at every step of the way along the run you just never know the idea is buy the best of the best and if you can handle it buy it don't worry about where it's at right now. They're going up, and that's what we feel. Amazon's a good example of that. I have to agree <laughs> with you. Well, Tony, it's been really great to uh, get to know you over the phone. Today is the first day I've ever met Tony. We have a lot of fun. August twenty seventh, 2022. It's the first that's day right. we ever met. Uh, but I feel like we've known each other for a very long time. It's been my pleasure, my it, friend. It has. It's been an awful lot of fun. And Tony and I are going to be seeking all kinds of different treasures. I love investing in things like these tickets and just collectibles and things that are hard to find. But I have one question before we uh -oh, go. Uh-oh, here it comes. This is the greatest question that anybody ever asked. Where do you see gold in 10 years from now? Today is August 27th, 2022. In 10 years from now, where do you see gold? All right, I'm not gonna be a, I'm not gonna be a genie and pull something out of a bottle and just throw a number at you. I'm going to ask, I'm going to put that right back on you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you up front that I see gold going up. I think it has to go up. We're living in a, in a, a hollow world right now as far as financials are concerned. I will put this to you and I will put this question to the folks. And I'll preface that with a little statement. All the central banks of all the governments all over the world are stocking up on gold. So then I ask you this, what does that tell you? That's my answer. Yeah, that's a good answer. Up. Because we know there isn't a whole bunch of gold. Although silver is very interesting. Well, silver goes hand in hand with it. I, it, it. Yeah, to some degree. I like silver, but I think it's more manipulated than gold does. And it seems like a lot of governments and banks are buying a lot of more gold. So my bet is on gold. 
Although I really like silver too, so. If you like one, you gotta like the other. When you're when you're a collector investor, as I am, you wake up each morning with just a different idea. I went to bed last night, I'm like, I need to buy more gold, and I woke up thinking, I should buy more silver too, and it That's just right. gets all complicated. But in the end, it's just a fun time, and you focus on things that are not mass produced, that are hard to find, that are graded authentic, right. and you know what they are, and you know long term, you're going to be a winner. I'm with you all the way on that, Todd. Yeah, I agree with and, you. And uh, I hope we've been educational to the folks that are listening here. And uh, I thank you for your time, and I hope you spent it well. Uh, and I uh, hope this stuff uh, does something, maybe inspire you. Well, God willing, we're going to have a lot more videos to talk about. I'm with you on that. Thanks for watching, folks.